question for all of you. Uh, what do you think is the fastest evolutionary process? What's the fastest evolutionary process you can think of? Anybody? Dinosaurs? Everybody knows what evolution is, right? Viruses. Okay. Huh? Viruses. Well, so in fact, it's also antibodies going on inside you right now as we speak. And one of the goals of our workshop is not to have an experimental component. We may be failing there. So what we're interested in is viral immune coevolution. Well, and interactions. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. And so if you think back to COVID, hopefully you still remember that time, right? Remember 2020, we had the Wuhan trust train, then 2021, we had Alpha, 2022, Omicron, and the story continues, right? And so the new strains kept emerging, and we started getting immunity against all strains, either because we got COVID or either because we got vaccinated. Either way, we got immunity. And so what does that mean? So that means that the virus infected us. This will be my representation of us. And what we have inside of us is we have antibodies that sit on B cells and sometimes go around. And basically, these antibodies protect us against viruses. That is the job. So when the virus gets into us too, we start having an arms race inside of us. This is happening inside you right now. So what happens is these antibodies or B cells, and I, for those of you in the workshop, I will be making a lot of simplifications. So don't get annoyed. If you really, really get annoyed, speak up. But just disclaimer, you know, there'll be a lot of things that you'll cringe about. All right. So what happens is that these B cells start evolving. That means that they try to find B cells that get better at recognizing this virus. Um, and so they do that. So I should be using a different color, but it doesn't matter. So they, they really change inside you, these things, such that they start being really, really good at catching the bad guy. Now, the bad news, so, so, you know, so you're fine at this point, but the bad news is that the bad guy, the virus, also evolves. So here, you get better, but virus evolves and spreads. So basically, out it comes, and in maybe a slightly different version, and the whole story repeats itself in somebody else. OK? So you see that basically your antibodies or your B cells, they exert selective pressure on the virus. So the virus attacks your immune system, but they turn back. But the virus evolves, and so do they. And then the pressure is still there, but it's weaker. But as the virus evolves, it gets weaker and weaker. But there's this constant arms race going on. And, well, OK. So um, we have this constant evolution. And what you probably also know is that mutations are random. So we get many, many mutations, both on the viral side and the immune side. And in principle, there's exponentially many possible mutations. Uh, so, however, we know 
from various evolutionary experiments and from observation that we don't see these exponentially many paths. The interactions between the two, and so that's why we're also interested in interactions, actually restricts the number of paths. And to some, to, so here we have what I'll call driving of one by the other, but the paths are restricted to, an, a, to such an extent that we can actually attempt prediction. And what some of us do is actually try to predict the future strain of the virus and help people decide what should go into your vaccine. And in fact, and of course some of us study this and track the virus and study evolution, some of us study this process of what goes on inside of you, and we don't like to study this as a sort of connected process. But in fact, this convergence is so strong that if you start collecting viral strains from all over the world, which is what some of us also do, uh, you can try uh, do dimensionality reduction and you come up with some sort of reduced, what will be called antigenic coordinate, which doesn't really matter what the word antigenic means other than it's related to the virus. Basically, you do dimensionality reduction, say on the flu, since we've been tracking it essentially since the 60s, and what comes up in most cases is roughly a straight, well, a, a, a one-dimensional process, okay? So I've just told you stuff's complicated. In principle, we have exponentially many paths, but if we take data from the world and we do some dimensionality reduction, we end up with a one-dimensional process. Okay? So that on one hand, okay, I'll say one type of flu before anybody, but for purposes, let's say flu. So that on one hand helps us with this, uh, with prediction. It also shows us that there is some possible dimensionality reduction or some lower dimensional space that we may hope to understand something about. And of course, all of us would like to figure out what this lower dimensional space is. But we do have some sort of quasi 1D process going on here. And this brings us back to another theoretical concept that was proposed by some of us who are unfortunately not here but would have liked to be here, uh, which is the idea of, again, if this is uh, some phenotypic space, which was called shape space by Alan Perelson who, and co collaborators who proposed it, uh, but basically what it is, it's just a phenotypic space that we as physicists, you know, when we don't know what to do, we come up with phenotypic descriptions, right? So this is exactly what it is. It's a low dimensional space where both viruses and antibodies happily live in and they cover this space in some way. And we can have different colors and so on. And the closer they are in this space, the more likely they are to recognize each other. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about today in more detail is actually trying to see, uh, well, describe what could happen in this. So, this is, a, this is low dimensional, that's the idea. We don't, of course, know anything about it. We don't know how low dimensional it is, but motivated by these experiments, we can sort of try to think about a one dimensional process. And that's what I'll do. Yes. I think you're um, monotonically increasing uh, code. Yeah. On the why, is that um, what, what exact, what's the quantity that you'll be picking? Complexity? No, no, I mean, okay, there's this, I mean, n no, it's just, it's really you do dimensionality reduction 
And it's, you know, it, in some sense, if you sample it over time, I mean, what it is really is it's proportional to the number of mutations. You accumulate mutations. You could plot number of mutations as a function of time. But this is obtained, I mean, actually, if you're here next week, uh, I think we will have talks about that, correct? Tile lineup is coming. But this is done by Trevor Bedford for the, f uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my plot, it's just to motivate one dimensional. But when Derek Smith did it, he got that from dimensional sailing. Then Trevor Bedford did it. And depending on whose hands, that the, the y axis means something slightly different because the dimensional reduction is slightly different. But whoever does it gets that, right? Do you, do you want to? Speak up, sir. I, I Yeah, it's if some phenotypic, but you know, precisely what it is can vary. All I, all I want to say is we have, if we look along this line, so I'm going to forget about these two axes now, and I'm going to, my life is going to happen here. Right. Okay. So if, and I was just like, if you, if you, so let's say if you represent a phenotypic space in however number of dimensions, yeah. and then you quantify the, let's say, the entropy in that space, that's what you're detecting anyway. No. So the diversity that's increasing. No. 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 No, I'm actually saying that it's canalized. I'm saying the opposite. That instead of, so I didn't draw my exponential, but if I really were to draw a branching tree of all the mutations that can happen, I would, you know, I would get entropy, I would get complexity. Both on the antibody, on both sides of this process, right? So, this would be the virus evolving and mutating. And what color did I use? I used this for the antibody, for the B cell, okay? I would get that. But in practice, what we see is we actually see strong canalization on both sides. And instead of having, seeing all of these exponentially many paths, we see something that seems like they're really following each other and picking one path. Yes? One-dimensional nature of whatever you're going to be talking about, is it related to the line being linear or to the existence of a line? That is a line rather than... Yeah, line. so, okay, so let me tell you. So this is one type of flu. Yeah, one type. This is, you know, another type of flu actually branches and has two coexisting branches. So I'm sort of pointing your attention to the fact that it's one line as opposed to many, many li coexisting lines and many branch it's lines with... Dependence on time, it's not important. It's no. the fact that it's a line. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. Okay. Happy? Everybody happy? Well, you'll never have everybody happy, so pour your head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, right, so specifically what I want to talk today, so I can talk again. All of, you know, and there's people in our workshop that are interested in recreating in the lab this evolutionary process and figuring out why it didn't go down here in this particular flu strain and in different things. And there's people that track it in the wild and there's, uh, we have our next strain representatives. If you read any popular, well, you know, any newspaper, you've maybe heard about next strain. So, and as I said, people who look in and actually what happens here. What I'm going to talk about, because I have to talk about something concrete today, is the notion of evolutionary, if I can spell it, evolutionary stability. Okay. So basically, I want to ask the specific questions of what are the conditions necessary for the virus and the immune system to coexist. Now, 
Now, so you probably know that the virus needs hosts to coexist, right? Viruses cannot survive on their own, so they need us. But this still doesn't, you know, they're not like a completely controlled entity with some main control tower, so they could have wiped us up, which they sometimes do. And on the other hand, why do we not wipe them out co completely? So what is the what is the stability condition? Okay, and uh, the reason that I introduced this is because I'm going to be working in this one dimensional space. And so, All right, so I want to divide this in half roughly, at least for now. Uh, and I'm going, so this is now my one dimensional coordinate, uh, which is this phenotypic, which is basically antigenic position or this phenotypic coordinate. Uh, and in this, we have a density of viruses, which I'm going to call N of XT, because this I'm going to call X. Um, so these are my viruses. And I have my immune system, whoops, which is tracking it. So I'm going to call this age, but I'm never going to talk about it again in detail. This is my immune density. Um, and so what happens is you see at the, at the tip of this uh, virus density, there's no immune coverage anymore. So the viruses will just grow and they'll grow proportionally to this number R naught that you've heard about, which is how fast a virus spreads in the com sorry, population, minus one minus the immune coverage that they have, where the coverage is the thing that comes from the immune system. And uh, basically, so you have this immune system pushing the virus population, so you get a wave that evolves with some speed v, okay? And uh, there's a little bit to add here. So how does it, why? Well, because viruses, so let me write down the virus equation. Let me do it here. So if I'm interested in how this moves with time. So viruses at any given time, they have some growth rate or fitness which will depend, so I might as well put it in straight away, on what's happening on with the immune system, but viruses also mutate, right? We talked about that, viruses mutate, and I'm going to assume that they mutate with a constant rate d. So basically they diffuse in this 1d space, and then I'm going to have some demographic noise on top of this. Okay, but this is basically, so this is growth, or what we like to call fitness. These are mutations. There is an immune response in my F, so let me make that clear with putting it in red. Okay. Um, okay, and what's important is that my virus population size is not constant. Okay, and then, but to get back to you, okay, so let me, let me explain what this coverage is. 
let me put it in this color. So coverage is basically the protection I have that the immune system gives me against the virus. And there's a very important concept um, in immunology, which is that of cross-reactivity. So if I have a given antibody, if I have a given B cell, I'm protected to any virus that might fall within this area. Okay? And we're going to call this the cross-reactivity range, and I'll give it a name as zero. This is called cross-reactivity. Basically, what it means is you don't just have a one-to-one -one protection, but you have these huge arms, and you can kill anybody around you. Okay? Yes. What, why, sorry? Uh, yeah. So why is the first maximum in the yellow curve? Yeah. Oh, here. Okay, yeah. So we're moving this way. Viruses are mutating like this. And everywhere where a virus has been, people have immunity. I see. And losing this because I Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, want, you, want, you want this to happen. Yeah. So that, that can happen and it won't have any, pro it really won't matter for what I'm going to tell you. And there's actually, okay, so you're actually asking a super, super deep question, which is one of the questions that we're discussing in our workshop. So the reason why it doesn't matter is because the virus is going that way. And um, you're, basically the virus kept, keeps escaping. And so you don't, it doesn't care in a way what happened in the past. Now, it could happen that it somehow comes back, but because we're in a very, very high dimensional space, really, that is highly unlikely. But there are people who worry, and we worry a lot about the time scale of decay of this memory. And there's actually very cool work uh, from Jesse Bloom, and I'm going to get nowhere with my talk, but this is great. I prefer it that way. Uh, so there was this boarding school in the UK in the six, late 60s, where all the kids got sick with the flu, but none of the teachers got sick in, with the flu. And I, you know, very clear cut thing. And that's because the teachers had immunity from the Spanish flu, which happened in 1918. Okay, so that's not true that everything must have that long memory. And in fact, we just had a talk about, you know, how long it goes. And, but basically, it does seem we have relatively long-lived memory. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Yeah, so sure. Is there a relationship between uh, this digital and like voice? Uh, is there some fluctuation, dissipation here? No, so, okay. So the demographic noise is, uh, is really small number noise coming from, uh, you know, basically zero, either you're there or you're dead kind of thing. It, but birth death noise, right? But the mutations are not what gives the birth death. So it's, it's like a little bit different. Well, no, okay, so sorry, that's actually not true. Okay, when you mutate, you do get a, you, you, you know, you start at zero. So when you have a new individual, this new individual, so in a way this generates uh, new individuals which are subject to this birth that noise. But you're basically asking whether this D enters the correlator of the noise. And the answer is no. Okay, anybody else? Good. So where was I? 
Okay, so I, 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 I described this, and so what this gives you, this cross-reactivity, and now my thing broke, is that this, in fact, this immune coverage has this veil, like the, this immune system has this veil, so it gives you the coverage you actually get is a little bit ahead, okay? So the orange thing will be the immune coverage. Um, and that's what I wanted to write out. So, why do I have it? Coverage. Um, is some integral of the immune system with some kernel in this space, with this R0 component, right? And where does coverage enter? Coverage enters, as I wrote there, uh, that this fitness is proportional to R0, 1 minus coverage. And if you want to be, there's an immune memory, the number of memories you have. So you can put that in, you cannot put that in, doesn't matter. But basically what this does is it couples an equation for N with an analogous equation for the immune system, which I won't, won't write out because the details of it don't matter. But you have the, you have the coupling here, okay? And so we get this nonlinear kind of diffusion equation and from other physical systems, you can intuit that this will have a traveling weight solution, and which allows for a solution with a constant speed. Okay, so now what's interesting here too is that we have two regimes, and that's why I drew it, drew it like this. So let me redraw regime number two quickly. Whoops, this thing, let me try to get it right. So this, the red thing is still the same, but what changes in this regime now is that this will be my regime, uh, if I write it here, let me write it here, of small cross reactivity, and this will be my regime of large cross-reactivity. So what do I do? I need to make my veil be much, much larger. So my coverage now goes out all the way here. And what does that change? Well, if I now want to think about viral fitness, so this is this thing, how fast the virus can grow, here, basically, here it was suppressed, 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 but once it got out here, coverage was zero, at least it should have been if I drew it well. So here the coverage goes very quickly to zero, and the viral fitness is essentially constant, okay? Basically, once you get ahead of this red thing, you don't feel the immune system anymore, and it's free for all, okay? Here, well, there is a regime like that, but I basically never get there. And you're in a regime of linear fitness, okay? Because everywhere you are out here, is you feel the immune system. Everybody happy with these two regimes? What's the, what's the between the two regimes? What's the parameter that the This, R0, cross-reactivity. So, so it should be smaller or larger than yeah. one? Okay, well, we'll get there. Right now I'm just waving my hands and intuiting oh. that these two regimes should exist and I should have an in-between land between them, okay? So, good, okay. And where I will want to get to, which I probably won't, but it's okay, is basically what 
regime is the flu in. So I was going to derive something for you, but I think I won't. Uh, so basically, we can solve this. We can solve this equation full stop. Okay, we can actually solve it analytically in the regime. Maybe let me try. So in let me just call it regime one and two, so I don't have to repeat it. In regime one of small cross reactivity. This equation simplifies, f is constant, so I can call it f max, n and d. If I forget about demographic noise for a second, um, I can go to the mutating, basically to the moving frame, or I can assume that n goes roughly as a sum phi f max t. And then I really just get the diffusion equation for this. And I can solve it. OK. So if I solve the diffusion equation, I will find that prefactors aside, it'll go like this. And since I ignored demographic noise, I know this will be valid for all virus sizes in basically in at any x. If I now, you know, if I think about this as bins, I can basically up until they get, if they're large enough. If they get to the order of one, I have to worry about noise. So I can figure out what that happens by taking the log of this. And if I do that, I know x is also vt, because I'm in the regime of the wave, or the 0, some of the t's cancel. And from this, I get the speed of the wave in this regime. And if I did a proper calculation and didn't just wave my hands, I would get the same result. So in this regime, this is the speed of the wave. More generally, there's an equation that I get. Let me put it out here, which defines V in all of these regimes. With This is the fitness. This is proportional to the slope of fitness, not exactly. This comes out of basically solving this detailed nonlinear equation, but it's an equation that relates fitness to the speed of the wave and was solved, in fact, by a lot of people in this room in other contexts, but gives us a much more hairier and uglier expression for the speed of the wave. And I'm mainly writing it out so that you have a, oh, this is so horrible compared to this expression. OK? So what it looks like is just to say there's two regimes for this all. So should I go directly to answer your question? Maybe quickly. The speed of this wave as a function of cross reactivity. So this R0 parameter is constant here and then goes like this. And here it has a decay of 1 over R0, which if you plug in the dependencies for R0, you get it there. But to answer your question, where is this famous crossover? So I'm going to plot the speed divided by the cross reactivity and f max in log space 
versus a dimensional parameter, which I will now define. So what is this dimensional parameter? Well, if this is my cross-reactivity radius, I want to know how long by diffusion, which is my mutational process, does it take to leave this cross-reactivity ball, right? So I'm doing a random walk, and how long will it take it for me to leave this? And that is R0 over D, R0 squared over D, right? So that is one characteristic time scale, time to escape immunity through mutations. And the other one is the growth rate or the doubling time in absence of immunity, which is Fmax, which is basically the thing here. So that's also a time scale I have. And so my dimensionless parameter is R0 over D divided by 1 over F max, so times F max. Okay? So basically what it is is the characteristic, the ratio of these two time scales. The ratio of the time to escape immunity from mutations to the growth rate of the virus in the absence of immunity. And if I now plot this renormalized speed versus this, I get something that looks like that, that has a crossover at around 10 to the, 10 to the, between 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3. And here I have a scaling which goes as k to the minus 2 thirds, and here I have a scaling that goes as 10 to the minus 1. Okay? So hopefully I've answered your question about the dimensionless parameter and the crossover. Yes. If you didn't have seasons. Yes, I it would. Like, it sounds like you're close to deriving what would be the revaccination time. If you didn't have seasons. That, that I, I feel very hesitant saying yes to that question because, you know, probably there's a, the, there's a lot of thing. there's a lot of reasons why the answer is no, and I'm, <laughs> I'm hesitating to name the main one, right? Um, it's not just seasons. It's diversity of immune... Uh, it's, it's, okay, animal reservoirs, let me start there. If we didn't have seasons and animal reservoirs, if we didn't have the complexity of other possible immune responses, anybody else come up with the, you know, main criticisms for what is wrong with this? But animal reservoirs are not in your model. No, they're not, exactly. I'm, Elias is basically saying if you didn't have seasons, I'm saying there's a lot more problems than not having seasons. <laughs> Anybody? What's the main problem? Richard, help me out here. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm doing very simplified treatment of the immune system. Yes. Yes, could you elaborate on Richard's point um, that took us with this model and then added in a couple of assumptions about immune memory kind of preventing the formation of responses to the immune strains, um, even when you can get infected by them, and it, it changes the, the math a lot and you're still not trying to do Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not presenting this as... Also, what I should say is 
So what I'm going to this and what I'm going so this you may recognize from your past life as a Fisher wave or an FKPP wave. If you've seen it before, uh, this is called linear fitness wave. These are two regimes of the wave. Um, the, I mean, this, I'm presenting it because some of us use this formalism and, you know, as I had to make a choice. This specific work is actually done uh, in collaboration with Victor Chardes, Andrea Mazzolini, who's in the audience over there. So if you have detailed questions about it, go to him and Thierry Mora, but uh, Boris Schreiman and Richard Neyer had an infinite dimensional version of this model and Sarah's working on it, so, you know, uh, it sometimes helps, it sometimes, as every phenotypic model, confuses things. All right, so how much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. My question, so what happens when it's not infinite and it's not one? In reality, is it some finite number? Right? No, in reality, it depends what you're looking at. I mean, for this process, it is one. If we look at, you know, this strain of flu, it, it I mean, it is one. We've also, with Michael Lessig, we looked at the, you know, two-dimensional version of this, and we asked about branch, you know, when do branching events happen, when do splits happen. Boris and Richard did that in, in higher dimensions. I mean, dimensionality matters. Yeah. And, okay, and there's a very cool, very theoretical question. So Daniel Fisher, again, somebody who wanted to be here is not here. You know, that, what is the dimensionality of the space? And we don't know, we'd love to know, right? It depends. Really. But it, uh, it surely the, the, the answer is it depends. But, you know, is it two? Is it five? It's probably not 50, okay? Because then we're not low dimensional anymore. It's probably also not really 11, right? So I'll, I'll put a cab on about seven, maybe six, right? But, but it's more than a three that we know. It depends, it depends. But, you know, of course, diffusion depends on the dimension and, okay, uh, 10 minutes, right. So evolutionary stability. So, let me erase, well, let me leave evolutionary stability. And actually, I didn't want to erase this, that's why I put it up. Although for now it seems irrelevant. Um, okay, and what I do want to carry over from what I just erased is my line. So this was to motivate that. So I want to have this line here with this K, which is which is, where is my K? Uh, this R0 over D F max, my 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 crossover, and here I have this Fisher wave, small cross reactivity, and here I have this linear fitness and large cross reactivity. Okay, onward. So, okay, evolutionary stability. So, how does, if you're a virus and you want to be stable, you're the resident virus, you rule the world. So, what do you want? You want to A, not die, B, you don't want any other viruses to take over from basically being the resident, from you as the resident virus. So, you don't want, so you want to be in a regime where any virus, where I mean any virus family who comes in will not outcompete you. That's what evolutionary stability means, okay? So I'm going to be working in a world where I'm going to be playing with mutation rates. So different viral empires have different mutation rates, and I'm going to be asking what is the evolutionary stable mutation rate. That means that if another viral empire wants to come in, and I don't mean one strain, 
I just mean a whole family who has a completely different mutation rate. Then I'm well, let's, let's I haven't let's said let's anything let's, yet. Let's, let's, let her, let's let her continue for a moment. Sorry. Continue your puzzlement quietly. Okay. Let's give her a few minutes. So it may seem to you that the faster I mutate, the better I am. But that's not the case because mutations come in two flavors, the good and the bad. So there's such a thing as a deleterious mutation rate. Sorry, deleterious mutations. And your R0 really is disadvantaged by deleterious mutations. So this is the fraction of deleterious mutations. Deleterious just means bad. Okay, so these are mutations that will make you be worse. Now, the other thing that is uh, complicated here is you may say, well, I just want to grow the fastest. I, you know, typically in evolution, we say you want to be the fittest, you want to grow the fastest. But here, your background keeps changing because what is best today will not be best tomorrow. So that is basically your, you know, you have a changing background, the fitness changes. So basically what evolutionary stability means is that you want to have a growth rate that is faster than all other mutants in the current background of the immune system. Arup, do you want to ask your question? No, I have to oh. <laughs> Okay. So what that means in math parlance or whatever parlance, wavy theoretical physicist parlance is that my invading mutant that I will prime here, this is the virus compared to my resident virus, whatever mutation rate it has, it, it has to be at the sweet point where you just can't do any better. Okay? So I'm basically doing linear stability and what this will do is it will give me a D star which is the evolutionary stable uh, growth rate. Right? So basically I'm saying let me introduce a primed virus population and I want to know what its growth rate is in the background of my current mutation state and I want every basically so this is the growth rate of invader so I want this every muta inv invader to basically do worse than my current virus and my current virus effectively in this growth rate has a growth rate of zero. And why I left this up is so in order to figure this out, I need to solve for this growth rate of the invader. And if I do that for similar reasons that I got this equation, I get this. Okay, I get that the growth rate of the invader is basically the fitness of the invader in this background, the slope minus the speed of the original virus mod and how the, the mutant behaves in it. And so then what I can do is I actually need to solve this and somehow oh, here it is. So new graph. So I solve this and I'm going to plot this optimal evolutionary stable mutation rate rescaled by my cross reactivity ball as a function of the, what did I call it, the lambda, which is the fraction of deleterious mutations. So fraction of whenever I mutate, how often do I get a bad guy that decreases my fitness? And if I do this, Again, this is log space. It kind of looks like this with a crossover exactly where you would expect it. So there's a scaling here 
which is minus 1. This is scaling here. This would continue like this. Minus 3 halves. Okay, so what does this mean? So how do we think about this? Well, we should think about it in a way that I'm keeping this fraction fixed of deleterious mutations. So I'm stuck with getting some percentage of bad guys, either a small percentage or a large percentage of these deleterious mutations. And then I'm asking, what should I do in terms of my overall mutation rate? Okay, small fraction, just so that everybody's on the same page. And here I'm saying, well, if I have a small, in all my mutations, if it's a small fraction that are bad for me, I can go wild and I can mutate as fast as I want. Well, as fast as I want. I, I can mutate the hell out of here, right? So, um, basically, what does that mean? If I now look at my growth equation, uh, if I'm in this regime, that actually corresponds to this other regime, the, fish, the, the, the Fisher regime. So I can get rid of this, and all I want is for this to be less than zero. So that gives me that 2D prime FT prime should be less than V star. And this is actually 2V prime squared. So here I get that my new mutant shouldn't go faster than my old mutant. And so what that tells me, other way around, so that tells me is that my old mute, my resident should mutate fast. In this regime, if I, again, solve this equation, it'll give me actually another result. It'll give me a result which says that now my R0 of my mutant of my residence should be larger than any other possible R0. So basically, I should grow fast. I shouldn't mutate fast because as I'm in a regime where I have, I'm imposed a large fraction of deleterious mutations. So whatever I, I don't want, I cannot mutate fast because that'll just keep making me worse and worse and worse. So whenever I'm not bad, I should exploit it. Okay? So what that means here is you want to maximize V, grow fast. And here you want to maximize R0, sorry, avoid, mutate fast, mutate fast, and grow fast. Okay. Um, good. So that's basically the, the two regimes. And what I wanted to end with is arguing, based on all of this, what regime is the flu in? Can anybody guess? Anybody that's not working on it? Okay, so we have two regimes. So let me, give you, uh, let me give you a bit of information that maybe will help you guess. So R0 of the flu is about 1.8. What does R01 mean? It means it's basically barely alive, right? R0 less than 1 means it's dead. The flu will die, okay? So, uh, I, I, you know, I have, I, I, I can sort of, so basically what, what we do then is that this gives us constraints. These two, these two equations actually constrain the space of possible R nodes and D stars. So wanting to be evolution, if we say, assume the flu is evolutionary stable, and then we could, since it works, we're confident that it's self-consistency is not a bad assumption, but it gives us some constraints on where the flu is. And then we get from that for the flu, knowing a zero or assuming a zero, we get a D star. So I don't have time to sort of walk you through this, but if you were to take a guess, would you be more over here 
or more over here? Who votes for more over here? That you want to mute, that the flu mutates as fast as possible. Okay. Who votes for more over here? That basically the flu grows as far as possible. As fast as possible. Nobody? Really? All right. Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so we're around, what is it? With this parameter six to the fourth, okay? And if we put that in and we get other observables that people have calculated, such as the incidence rate or the time to the most common recent ancestor for the flu, we get them about right. So that's why maybe with all the caveats and all the problems with all of this, we're not completely off with it. But yeah, but the flu is here, which means basically uh, it is fairly close to this, but still surviving uh, relatively okay. All right, I'm done. Does anybody else want to answer that question? I mean, okay, so maybe one answer is that we do assume we're in some sort of steady state here and we're in a steady coexistence of the immune systems and the virus. I'm not sure Ebola is there, right? No, good, okay. Yeah, so wrong framework for Ebola. So prior to the flu, what would be the other, sorry, prior to COVID, yeah. Well, so I think COVID we're getting here now. COVID is now here, right? Uh, when COVID appeared, it wasn't there for the same reasons as Ebola. Okay, other virus which, with which we're sort of happily coexisting, CMV, it's like 70% of us have it. You don't even know you have it. That's a chronic infection. That's a chronic infection, yeah. Coronaviruses. No. Yeah. Yeah. But it's cro it's chronic, so it's yeah. That's the. This is the first variable I haven't mentioned that comes to your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that plays a huge role in evolution. Neutral, neutral mutations. Yeah, okay, I, you're basically saying I haven't mentioned neutral mutations. Is that, is that, I mean, I, if, you, if you, I mean, I need, I need a second to get from this level of description to the compactness of the viral genome. Right, so what about the compactness of the viral gene? Basically the space of possible neutral mutations. So yeah, so D star, I mean, basically maybe you can think of anything that's not, uh, that, that's not deleterious as neutral. If you, I mean, we also can break this up into antigenic and non-antigenic mutations, right? So, I mean, this is a this is a model for the population, right? But all this is assuming the power of the lambda. Yeah. It's Basically, everything that's not and that's not deleterious is either neutral or you know somewhat weakly beneficial. But we're we're not really. Yeah, like you can think about it as neutral. <laughs>